Meet Joey Shama, the co-founder of ELF Cosmetics. At 23, he was just a kid with a vision. But with the power of e-commerce and a bulldozer mentality, he built a budget cosmetics brand that would eventually evolve into a billion dollar publicly traded company. How'd he do it? Find out tonight on this episode of From the Founder. The entrepreneurial spirit is the cornerstone to the American dream, a beacon to all willing to weave their story into the fabric of our history. I'm Elliot Dweck, and this is From the Founder. So growing up, it was less about business sense, but it was more about leadership. One instance I really remember when I was uh, a, the president of the youth division at the center, I was actually um, working with um, the youth director and she told me, she goes, you're going to be successful in life. And it's really stuck with me since then. And I guess there was just a certain level of maturity about how I approach things, but also my bulldozer type mentality to get things done. Now, when she said this, did you feel like you were a natural leader? No. I didn't really understand it until I would say 20, 25 years later. Even through the early years of my career, I was always torn between was I just being lucky or was I being, or was I different in some way. So when you went to college, what, what, did, what did you think you wanted to do? College was an interesting experience. So, okay, so this is... That's my uh, NYU, undergrad degree from NYU, 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 not in finance. Right. <laughs> what was it, international business and marketing? Yeah. I was the only guy in Stern who was majoring in international business and marketing. I was the only one not pursuing a finance degree. Right. Um, but what I did know what I wanted to do, and it's kind of like, does the end justify the means, is I wanted to make money. My father had a company that went back 25, 30 years in the apparel space, but his company wasn't something of interest to me because it was more of a uh, private label manufacturer. So he was great at what he did, but he only did necessarily what the retailers wanted. I was more interested in the marketing element, I was interested in building something, and I was really interested in building something that was marketable that someone else would be interested in buying, right. which we ended up achieving. So you, you kind of had, you, you knew where you were gonna go. You had the idea, I'm gonna make a marketable product that somebody else would be interested in at some point. Exactly, I knew what I wanted to achieve, but to me, you know, it wasn't about a passion for beauty, it wasn't about a passion for accessibility to makeup, it was a passion about finding a white space and just going to that white space and bulldozing it and finding a way to get it done and different and just growing it from there. Well, now you're looking for a white space in any industry. What makes you say, okay, I'm going to make, like how do you even know about makeup? So it, it was a little bit of a joint effort. I did have a co-founder who was from the beauty space. Our initial concept was to bring simplicity to the market with a quality spin. And we brought it to the retailers and we said, guys, we have your problem solved. We're gonna give you good quality makeup. We're gonna put it together. And they said, thank you, but we're not interested. And it was, so uh, nobody's interested in, in the side. No, nobody was interested. I mean, I recall the, our first meeting with Target. Uh, the Target buyer said, Elf? Why would I wanna put something called Elf on my face? And <laughs> that was, uh, That's a good you point. don't really have yeah, an yeah. answer to that. So we kind of went back to the drawing board and we did two things that really enabled us to build the brand. Um, and the brand that it's flourishing today. The first thing was to uh, hire a PR firm. We hired a fantastic PR firm that got us to every single magazine. I did these desk sides where I met um, with the editors and we showed them the whole product line and we didn't tell them the price. We went through the whole sale and we told them, how much would you pay for this? And they're like, oh, it looks great. I don't know, $10, $12. And then we said, well, what if I told you everything was a dollar? And they flipped. I mean, we got, we were set up to get a ton of press. So it was Glamour Magazine that actually called us up and said, all right, we're putting your concealer in the magazine. They said, the only problem is I'm gonna put it in the magazine and my readers are gonna to wanna to get it. So where are they gonna get it from? Right. So they're like, either you go to Walgreens and you put it in all Walgreens stores tomorrow, any national retailer, or you uh, open a website. We're like, all right, I think a website may be a little bit easier at this stage in the game. We opened up our doors on e-commerce. Okay, so there's a story about some sort of email rumor that went around. Yeah. It was September 16th, 2006. We were sitting in a meeting. We just got back from an industry trade show. All of a sudden, we get a call, and I answer the phone, and this woman goes, she was asking me questions about the brand. I said, where'd you hear about us? She's like, I just got an email from my niece about you. So I look on the order manager, and I see orders flooding in. Flooding in, I go, what'd the email say? 
She said that Elf Cosmetics, all the products are a dollar, but Bloomingdale's just bought the brand and all the prices are going up, so buy it now. <laughs> we went from getting about 300 orders a week at the time to 18,000 orders a day for six weeks. Wow. Yes. I was right before the Jewish New Year, and about a week later, I was on a plane to China where I spent the next two months figuring out how we're gonna fulfill the internet orders. I vividly remember a conversation with my father, who was my partner in the business, and he said, this is your time. You either figure it out or go home. After you got this email, your dad says, this is it. This is, this is your opportunity. You fly to China and you're, you're living in China for two months. Yes. And you're in your mid-20s. I was, yeah, I was 23 years old. I had a son. I, I was married. I wow. left my wife. I said, I'll see you later. <laughs> I spent some of the Jewish holidays in, uh, in uh, Shanghai and in Hong Kong. They were probably the most memorable holidays I've ever experienced. <laughs> we didn't have the product. We didn't have the systems. We were literally printing packing lists and packing lists and packing lists, and we had to get it all done as quickly as possible. We shipped 192,000 orders in these big boxes. We were gonna do $2 million in sales at the end of 2006. Between September and the end of the year, we ended up doing about $8 million. Wow. Um, and it was our opportunity to really, you know, make this a business. And that's when we really got on the radar screen for the different retailers and, and found opportunities to, to really grow the business. Which now you had built out that infrastructure. Yes, we built it out but it was pressure tested um, right. as we started to grow. It was by necessity. <laughs> yeah. So now you come back from China, honey, I'm home, and now, now we're flying. Now we're in a different league. Right. We're no longer this small indie cosmetic brand that you may have heard of. So retailers are calling you now. So yes, I remember I went for pizza in 2007, <laughs> and I get a call and an email from the senior buyer at Target and she tells me, can we make an end cap, so it's like on the end of an aisle, for holiday products for Elf? And we said, sure, you know, of course. We got a four foot section at Target, and that's when we really started to mature as a brand and take it to the next level. Wow. I was worried about how I was gonna do $125,000 in sales a month. Now I'm doing, you know, $200,000 a week, and that's when, the private equity and the investment bankers and all that started calling. Right. Is this a moment where you realize, I think I'm at the next stage of the vision that we had in the beginning? So I was, I was actually online for Dumbo in Disneyland <laughs> when I got a call on my cell phone from an investment banker. We went through a process. We engaged a company called Financo who worked with us to market the company. Now, is this something you're just exploring? Or you're saying, okay, I know that we're ready to sell. So, we're, yeah, this is just exploratory. And we set a record for the most inbound bids. We got 17 bids, and we ultimately decided to partner with a private equity firm in a minority sale, so we control, so it was still our show. Right. But we had um, a private equity partner uh, end of 2010. Now this is the this is your first exit, right? How old are you at this point? At this point, I am 29 years old. I so see, 29 years old. <laughs> did you still want to control it? Like, wh wh what did you want? I didn't know what I wanted, and it was more of a personal choice to to say, as they say, to take chips off the table. To know that if I woke up tomorrow and Elf went away. I'd still be able to be okay. Did I make the best decision in hindsight? No, it wasn't the best one. Why? Because if I waited, I probably could have sold Elf for a lot more, a lot quicker, um, and a lot better. I'm still a shareholder in Elf as it's a public company today, um, but I did the best decision that gave me peace of mind and took stress off of me for my day to day, which is something that you can't put a price tag on. Right, you take some chips off the table, Maybe sleep a little better at night. <laughs> How many years after that was the second exit? So before the second exit, we actually had an inbound inquiry from some strategics. L'Oreal was buying Elf for a nice amount. The week before we were supposed to close, I got a call from my good friend, my investment banking friend, who said L'Oreal's pulling out and my heart sunk. We just lost this huge deal. It was done, finished. In hindsight, we were able to you know, continue to grow the business, put our heads down, 
And 12 months after that, so about two and a half years after the initial deal, we got a better deal done with another private equity firm who was now going to own a majority of the company. We were going to still be involved, but we were going to be more in the back seat as part of a management and an executive team. My father and I stayed with the company for about another 18 months. And what we learned in those 18 months was really invaluable. I didn't go to, I didn't get my master's, I didn't go to an MBA program, but I had the benefit of an MBA program coming into my house and running the company for two years. At the end of this 18 months, there's talks about taking the company public. And at that point, you and your dad look at each other and you're like, this might be the time where we're out. At that point, we said, I think you guys got it from here. And we decided to, <laughs> to leave the company. Now you're not involved at all in, in ELF at this point. Now what? So that was an interesting day. I remember waking up early 2016 and saying, you know, I have some type of financial stability, but I have nothing to do. Um, and it was a rough patch. I remember a day, you know, a few days, not changing out of my pajamas. My kids left for school, came home from school. They're like, what'd you do today? I was like, I don't know, watched House of Cards on Netflix. <laughs> like, So were your kids saying like, Daddy, it's four o'clock. What, what are you doing sitting in the kitchen? Yeah. All right, so you're doing, you're doing the, uh, the pajamas, House of Cards thing. Eventually that gets a little old. You're sitting home for, for six months. And I'm sure you're talking to people and saying, okay, what do I want to do next? How, what, where do I want to invest? Right. What's the next step? I got a call from a friend who had an opportunity. He was involved with a licensing group that was interested in buying a, uh, an active brand called Guy M. And they, the licensing group needed someone to operate. And being, and being an operator, and he knew I had time on my hands, he said, I think I have the right guy for you. And we partnered up with uh, Sequential Brands Group to purchase Guy M. Americas from its founder. And we bought the operating company and they bought the intellectual property, the IP. And we entered into a licensing agreement with them to um, uh, make the product under their brand and pay them a royalty. You're doing the same thing that you're doing with makeup, except you're selling fitness accessories. I would, exactly, and it's now 10 years later I have, I'm still an entrepreneur. I have a lot more experience under my belt. I just came out of my master's degree uh, program at Elf University. I remember when we bought the company, they had an accounting staff of 27 people. We have an accounting staff of three. So finding ways to operate efficiently, we brought their uh, net operating costs of the company we bought was about $34 million. We ended the first year at 16. Today, you're running this operating company called Fit for Life. There's a lot of different brands that you've licensed. So building off of the platform that Gaim afforded us, we were able to really uh, leverage the relationships that they had, as well as the know-how we have to be best-in-class operators. Mm. We have Fila, we have Reebok, we have Adidas, we have Tommy Copper, we have Gaim, we have Spry, and it, you know, we control a very big portion of the market in traditional retail. There's no chair here. Eating. No, there's no chair. There's chairs over there, but... It's not for you. <laughs> it's for lunch. Yes, all day, you're just staying straight. Usually I'm actually, I leave one foot up here and I'll be like on it, but I'm always standing on it. Like, Got it. Yeah, like I'll do like that, or you know, you move around. So when you guys are making products, are you thinking about what you want in your office? No. no. <laughs> This is a sample. No, I mean, uh, it's not about me, it's about the customer. Right. Doesn't matter what you want. <laughs> no, it definitely doesn't matter what I want or what I like. Right. What, what keeps you motivated? What's important to me is being and continuing to be successful. Continue to have operating companies that are profitable and that are making money year over year. So, you know, I could start about setting up my kids for success like my father did for me. Is there a point in the near future where you just think about packing it up and moving down to Florida. <laughs> just saying, all right, nah, I, I, mean, I proved myself. I did this eight times. You know, I, I had that six month hiatus in between Elf and Fit for Life. It was a rough patch. I'm not ready to play golf. <laughs> I'm, ready to, I'm ready to work less and earn more, um, but I need to be busy. The, when you were in high school and that woman told you, I know you're gonna be successful and you didn't really understand it. Do you understand what she was talking about now? I do. It wasn't until Fit for Life was successful that I really understood it. 
Because the elf narrative and the elf story, again, you don't know if it's luck or, you know, was I just in the right place at the right time? After I saw it, after I saw it a second and a third time, I understood that it's not that it was luck, but it was also seeing how different people operate and knowing that I operate differently. And it's just my impatience or desire to get things done and move on to the next thing that really enabled me to, to build off the success. Was that impatience ever a negative? Good question. The impatience is definitely a negative because, you know, a lot of times you wanna, you know, it, it comes off in the little things. I'll respond to an email too quickly or I'll get hot-headed quickly. What was it like the day that the company IPO'd and you were on stage at the Wall Street Stock Exchange? The night before, I have a good friend who has an office on Wall Street and they sent me that the New York Stock Exchange was draped in these elf banners <laughs> and elf makeup. I brought my wife and my kids and my parents and um, it, was, it was awesome. I would say it was a validation to what we built, but it, it exceeded our wildest expectations. And we were on the exchange floor. We go up, we ring the bell, but that's not when the magic happened. Okay, so this is the picture of the IPO day. Yeah, it was actually a gift from uh, the uh, CEO from ELF. And it was, it's a great commemoration of that exciting day. You could see me and my father in the picture and everyone's excitement. Everyone's mid-clap. What mid did they say that everyone was clapping? Did they tell you guys to clap? They don't really say. Yeah, they just tell you to clap and scream. Yeah, and, and then you get excited. But uh, it was it was fun. That's very I mean, you're cool. on the, literally a global stage. Right. The whole world's looking at you. After the market opens, before the stock goes live, it's about an, it could be a half hour, an hour, and then there's this big bell on the stock exchange floor. And when you're ready, when it's priced and it's ready to go, the, or the CEO, he hits the bell, or someone, he hits the bell and it goes public. We went public at 17, we IPO'd at 17.50 a share, but the stock opened around $23 a share and we eclipsed the billion dollar valuation. It was somewhere between the 17, it was about 20, 21 or $22 is where we hit the billion dollar. So we were able to pat ourselves on the bat, officially <laughs> being unicorns. Right. Um, and that was, a, that was a very, very exciting day. So you went from when all the retailers said, we're not interested, to now <laughs> this is worth over a billion dollars. Correct. Did you look at your, your father and be like, I think, I think we proved them wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an emotional guy. You could ask uh, my wife and kids, but that was an emotional day that it was just, it was just exciting. Like very few people, are able to experience it and experience it like that. And it was a great ride and it was a lot of fun. This is a question that you brought up earlier. Was it all just luck? I think success means when luck meets opportunity. I don't think I'd be sitting here today if the Bloomingdale's email didn't go out. But I also use that Bloomingdale's email as a stepping stone to bring the brand to the next level. So people get lucky all the time and people, there are definitely smarter people than me in the world. But when you are able to take the luck and make that into opportunity and really, in our case, in this case, monetize it, that's when you have success. Right.